Uh, could you let me know again in the chat if you can hear me? Yes, I see Dobri Vecher. That's great. If you can hear me, see me. Uh, yes, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So we'll wait uh, a couple of minutes for everybody to uh, to get in. Um, it's uh, yeah, we're excited about today's lecture. We have a small change in uh, in our second speaker because of unforeseen circumstances. We found out that architects are really busy and working day and night. As you know, we have translation available. Um, it's behind the small button interpretation. And my colleague Yelena uh, will share some information in the, yeah, in the chat app. If you cannot hear me, uh, you have to turn on the right channel. Um, so I hope, I think uh, most people can, uh, uh, can hear me. Uh, so that is great. We'll wait a couple of more minutes. It's great to see that you're also quite active in the Telegram chat app. Uh, my colleague will also share that, my colleague Yelena Cipanina. Uh, and I want to thank specifically Zina Ida for helping us out. Uh, uh, by transcribing the first lecture into Russian. It's really nice. And I know other people have been helping recording this also, everything in, in Russian um, to publish on, uh, on YouTube. So it's good to have you, uh, to have you with us, Howdy. Um, yes, and my colleague shared also the, the Telegram chat app. It's great to continue our conversations uh, there. Now today I'm very happy that my role is very small. Um, so maybe I will already ask Pascal to, uh, to turn on her video so we can welcome her back, our moderator and the speaker of course of last, uh, last week's second lecture. Hi Pascal. Hello. Um, as you know, my name is Jerke Verschoor. I'm the director of the Netherlands Education Support Office based in Moscow. And we work on uh, education uh, between Russia and the Netherlands. And we hope to connect as many of you uh, as we can um, if you have questions about it, by the way, on, uh, on the education in the Netherlands, feel free to, uh, to connect with us as well. Um, and tonight, we, uh, yeah, we, we, we enter our third lecture, uh, and then we're halfway with three more to go. And uh, yeah, with no further ado, I would like to give the floor to Pascal Leistra, who will introduce the lecture and the speakers. And I wish all attendees uh, a wonderful evening. Please um, 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 ask questions and do that in the Q&A function. So not in the chat app, but in the Q&A function. And as you know, uh, afterwards, they will be moderated by Pascal uh, to the speakers. Pascal, I will shut up and I give you the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Jerke. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm looking forward uh, to this uh, great, uh, exciting uh, event. We ha will have uh, two very interesting, inspiring uh, lecturers. Um, lecture of today is called Future Cities. Actually, it's about in the 21st century, never before have, uh, have more people chosen to live in urban areas. As a result, more cities are planning to add high rise to their skyline, skylines. Um, but what, uh, sh should we do in Holland, for example, we ha really have a very small uh, country uh, regarding uh, to Russian country, which is, of course, huge. So in Holland, uh, high rise is one of the solutions to this uh, lack of houses. Um, Stefan Al will tell us everything about it, uh, about the... Um, Sorry, oh, but what are the best ways to incorporate tall buildings into the urban fabric? And what should life and future high rise be like? In this talk, we will explore some of the most innovative ways in which skyscrapers can contribute to urban life, including by integrating them with transit hubs, sky plazas, and natural spaces. Um, about Stefan Al. Uh, Stefan Al, he is uh, born in the Netherlands, but already for quite some years a uh, resident uh, of New York City. Um, Stefan Al, he is an architect, urban designer, researcher, and educator. He worked on some of the world's largest structures, including the 2,000 feet tall Canton Tower. 
He serves as a professor at various uh, institutions, such as uh, Columbia University. In addition, he was also invited to be a TED resident and advisor to various city governments, including, including Hong Kong. In addition to his work as a designer, he has published eight books that explore depressing design challenges in cities. They have been widely acclaimed, including by the Wall Street Journal, Architectural Record, The Times, and the NPR. And some of the titles are Beyond Mobility, Villages in the City, The Strip Las Vegas, and uh, May next year, 2022, sorry, um, the book High Rise will be published. Stefan, I would like to give the floor to you. Thank you, Pascal, and also for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Nufik and, and Jerke. And you know, thank you, everyone who is currently listening. I'm, I'm so excited that you're you know, here uh, with me right now. I wish I could be there in person, but I hope you know, one of these days we can do it again. Uh, and I would love to <clears throat> meet all of you and, and see some of the exciting architecture that's going up right now um, in Russia. So thanks again. Uh, really, really uh, excited about it. So let's let's dive in. So a couple of questions I would like to frame this talk around, and some some questions that kind of fascinate me. Uh, and you know, a lot of it will be about high rises, but I think a lot of this is also applicable to other types of buildings. And one of those things is 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 a question I've had is you know how can architecture and structure become one, and and what would be the benefits and if, if you're looking at our bones, like 20% of our bones, our, our bones are super strong, right? And you would expect them all to be solid, but 20% of the bones is, is soft bone. It's a bit like this. The, the tissue uh, is not solid. There's all these kind of fine lines. Uh, and, and why is that the case? Well, nature has a very efficient way of allocating resources. So as we grow, as we you know, drink milk uh, as babies, uh, we have a limited supply of, of, of resources uh, to grow our bones. At the same time, we have a lot of time to grow. So nature has figured out a way to create a structure, in this case, you know, a bone, uh, that is very good at, at, and capable at optimizing kind of surface pressure on the outside, uh, but with a minimum amount of resources, right? So in a time of resource scarcity, uh, this is an extremely efficient structure. If you look at birds, that's even more efficient. Uh, so birds over millions of years, uh, you know, nature and, and, and evolution, they've, they've become more efficient, so, so to say. So the beak, this is a uh, kind of a section of a bird's beak, uh, it, it's, it's not solid, right? There's a lot of air in there. Uh, nature has figured out a way to distribute uh, resources in, in the most efficient way to create kind of the best uh, possible structure with the least amount of materials. Now, that is true of architecture too, right? We're, we're trying to create beautiful, strong structures, particularly for high-rise buildings. You know, a lot of it is the lateral forces, but we want to minimize the amount of material on structure. So if you look at our earliest structures, it was very much the case that the structure became the architecture, right? So this are, you know, the beautiful Gothic cathedrals in which kind of the, the structure, this very efficient way of, of moving the, the lateral forces, moving the gravitational forces down uh, from, from the side, right? So gravity uh, pushes down, but, but wind pushes from the side. So how do we move those forces down to the foundation where we want them more uh, vertical? I, I mean, Gothic cathedrals are a perfect expression of structure. Now, this brings me to Moscow and Vladimir Shukov. Uh, I'm a big fan of his work. Uh, and I'm sure many of you know about him and, and this tower, but what's so striking about him is that he was an engineer, very interested in finding these very efficient structures. Uh, and one of those structures was the hyperboloid, which is a type of shape like, like you're seeing right now. You've got these kind of straight lines that go all the way down. It's a form of a, of a diagrid, as we also call it, but it's a very efficient shape. And he proposed this around the same time of the Eiffel Tower, and he would be able to, he was planning to, to build a structure taller than the actual Eiffel Tower, and it was going to be constructed with only a third of the resources 
simply because the, the shape of the structure, we also call this topology, his topology or his, stru his structural shape was more efficient than the kind of traditional R shape of the Eiffel Tower. Now, unfortunately, it was never built this tall because there was a lack of steel. Uh, if you go into his diary, he was kind of nervous about that. At one, at one, at one point, he was afraid he was going to get shot because he wasn't sure he was going to finish the tower, but he completed the tower and you know, it still stands today. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because, you know, one of the first projects I worked on uh, after graduation was this, this project. Uh, it was at the time the world's tallest tower at 2,000 feet. It was a competition that I joined uh, with a small architectural office based out of Amsterdam called Information Based Architecture. Uh, and to our surprise, we ended up winning the competition and, and building this, uh, this structure. Um, and what's, what's interesting about it is that it's kind of a new take on, on Shukov's hyperboloid, right? So Shukov invented the hyperboloid, but what we did differently, instead of kind of a, a cone that was looking the same from every side, we twisted it. Uh, and the advantage there is that uh, you create kind of a narrow waist. So, so instead of a, a tower that has kind of a, a, a straight profile, here you get a narrow waist. And the other thing we did is that um, instead of a round uh, profile, we used an elliptical profile. And the benefit of that is that you can create new directions. Uh, and this creates, this makes sure that the tower is asymmetrical from every time, from every distance. So, you know, the Shukov tower looks the same from every angle in the city, but if you change that to an ellipse and you twist the ellipse, then you get a very dynamic profile in the skyline. So sometimes it's much fatter, you know, other times it's, it's narrower, uh, and the nickname for this tower is, is Xiaomanyao in Chinese. It's, it's bit, uh, the built in Guangzhou, in the south of China, uh, which means a thin, uh, a woman with a with a thin waist. Uh, so I think that's a that's a good uh, compliment. Uh, but really, based on the on the hyperboloid, uh, and you can kind of see the efficiency here because it has all these straight lines. It's an exoskeleton, which means you know the structure is on the outside. Uh, but a very kind of dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, place. So here's the, the lead architect, uh, Mark Hemmel. So what we did at the top floor is we had all these sky boxes uh, that kind of stick out the building and, and people uh, can experience kind of the, the city outside of this structure. Uh, and today, if you go there, you can even, you know, walk and climb along the, the structure and, and look at these, these views. So obviously that was never done in the original Shukov, but remember, you know, Shukov was really an engineer. He built these towers as water towers or as, as radio towers. You know, today we build TV towers, not really for that anymore, right? It, it's, it's more about recreation and, and, and a symbol for the city. So the utility of it has, uh, has changed a lot. Uh, so now, even if you go to the top of the tower, there's these bubble trams uh, on which you have Kind of views all over uh, all over the city, so you can be spinning in those in those cabins um, around the around the tower. Stefan, can I can I very shortly inter interrupt? Yeah. Um, we see these um, uh, these gray areas in your presentation. Is it possibly due because you have? Uh, do you see them as well or not? Because we don't completely. see Oh, them I don't see them. I don't see um, them yeah. Do you have some other notification uh, things on? Perhaps uh, the, the the chat function on or. There is a chat function on, yeah. Yeah, now it's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you continue like this, uh, wait, no, 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 no. Okay. Now, now we see everything is gray. Um, uh, if yeah, if you can then share like no, now it's back on again. I don't know why that is. Um, That's very strange. It, I think I have if, another computer. If 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 you want, to can try that. What about now? Yeah, we see some. It's it's not usually interfering. Just so you know, the right part of your presentation there is a, a block hanging over it. So just if you mm. have something very far right, otherwise, uh, and now it's actually you moved it to the left, and now you moved it again to the right, and now completely to the left. Okay, so what you, about this? Uh, yeah, now it's very small, so now it's much better. If you leave it like this, then uh, it's or if I move this to the bottom over here, is this better? Uh, yeah, it's yeah, and there's something also on top. And now it's almost gone. It's very good, and that that's on top. I don't know what it is. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. that's um, that's a zoom bar. That's strange. Yeah, but it it did. Yeah, but that that hardly uh, interferes actually. So I propose you continue. Okay. That's uh, this, <laughs> right, is, this okay. is much better. Thanks. 
shall I go back to some of the images? No, 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 no. Right it was here? actually, yeah. it was, it was, I thought I, I interrupted. Okay. okay. Yeah. No, no, it's, right. it was fine. Please continue where you stayed. <laughs> okay. Sorry All to right. interrupt. Yeah. No, no, no. Thanks for letting me know. I appreciate it. So the second question, how do we design for serendipity, right? So there's a lot of benefit to, to, to living in cities, right? And, and one of the researchers that writes about this, you know, what do, what do cities bring to, uh, to human life and to resource efficiency is Jeffrey West, who is a theoretical physician, a physicist. Uh, and he publishes a book called Scale. And, and he finds that when things scale, they, there's a resource efficiency, a little bit like economies of scale, right? So he studies animals uh, and the meta metabolic rate, for instance, of elephant versus you know, mice. And it turns out that you know, elephants have a lot lower um, metabolic rate, uh, rate per mass, per body mass than uh, a mouse has. And you know, so, so when things scale, they, they become more efficient. And it's the same for cities. Uh, when, when cities, you know, grow bigger, there are uh, lots of benefits. You know, there's fewer gas stations per capita. You know, there, there's, there's more, uh, there, there, there are more uh, interconnections between people. And that's, that's the thing I want to focus on right now, right? So if you look at cities, they outperform rural areas in, in many things, including in, in innovation, uh, so if you look at the number of patents per capita of cities versus rural areas, uh, cities outperform rural areas. Um, and part of the reason why is because, you know, people have more chances of encounters with other people, uh, right? And it's particularly that serendipitous encounter, that unexpected encounter with someone else that could be very, very uh, productive. And there's a fascinating um, uh, research uh, that was conducted by Professor Allen uh, at MIT, and he calls it the Allen curve. And he found that when, when people are closer to each other, I mean, it's kind of obvious, the frequency of communication increases. Uh, so he talks about the infinite corridor at MIT. It's this long corridor where, where students meet or they bump into each other uh, in between classes. It's, it's unintended. Uh, this, this campus was never designed around this corridor that people would bump into each other, but, but nevertheless, it has you know, many benefits. However, if you look at today's, uh, a lot of today's uh, buildings and offices, they are not meant for uh, collisions. They're not meant for these kind of casual uh, encounters. Uh, we find ourselves in cubicles kind of boxed off from, from other people, like in this movie, uh, Playtime by, by Jacques Tati. So how do we how do we still harness the benefits of cities where we're, you know, put together, right, in, in a small space, and we can learn from each other, uh, and and we can, you know, brainstorm and and and, and get ideas, but at but at the same time, uh, kind of avoid uh, this isolation that we also see with cities. So here's this uh, Professor Allen, right, and his book, and he looks at managing the flow of technology, and he's and he says that there is this disjunction between the way in which we kind of plan an organization, right, which always looks very hierarchical, uh, and the flow of information or the flow of technology. And the communication network that you see in the right is very different from a, a typical organizational chart. Right? It's because organizations don't work just work in hierarchies, right? There's lots of information flow between people uh, that is just as important. And in a knowledge-based economy, you could argue it's perhaps the most important, right? So companies like you know, Apple or, or Pixar or Google or you know, all those tech giants, uh, their, their real resource is kind of the innovation by the people, right? And how can you increase that innovation? By having those connections between people. So Steve Jobs, he was one of the early investors of Pixar and for the headquarters, the new headquarters, he was very much involved and he wanted this big central space where all the rooms would be uh, looking out uh, over this central space, including you know, the, the offices, the conference rooms, the mail office, the mailbox, the, the toilets, the restaurants, so that people would be able to bump into each other. Uh, and that was really kind of a central element. Now that's all good for uh, low rise buildings, right? Pixar is maybe a couple stories, but what about high rise buildings, right? And, and very often we think of, 
these uh, dystopian images of you know Michael Wolf of Hong Kong, where people are like boxed into different apartments, or think about uh, Ballard's book High Rise, in which he, he talks about kind of the, the the separation and the alienation that happens when people are boxed into these different units. Uh, and and if you know the the work, there's also uh, a movie that you will see that this whole uh, <laughs> high rise just collapses at the end because people start to hate each other <laughs> and, uh, and, and a lack of communication is, is part of that. Now, there's been some really great projects lately that try to overcome this problem of the high rise, which is fundamentally about stacking people. So how can we avoid that feeling, right, that, that we are isolated? There's a beautiful project by the Dutch firm MVRDV in Amsterdam, the Valley, uh, in which, you know, instead of people being isolated, there's all these balconies where, where people can run into each other and also integrates with, uh, with green space. Um, and I've been really focused on bringing some of those ideas to office buildings, right? So typically high-rise offices are just stacked floors, but what if we layer it more uh, and we create more sky gardens and openings uh, and, <clears throat> and create more opportunities for people uh, to interconnect. So there's there's lots of benefits to this typology. First of all, I mean, this was a project for a very humid climate. So the only way to, to uh, improve thermal comfort for people it, then is through cross ventilation, right? So, so having a more porous uh, building will allow for that. The other benefit is, you know, once you start breaking up some of those big slabs into smaller buildings, uh, is that you can improve views, right? So in this case, this was a large resort I worked on uh, outside of Singapore on the island of Batam. Uh, so on one hand, you know, we wanted to have as much density uh, as possible, but at the same time, we wanted to make sure that there was enough views for everyone. So we conducted this simulation to, to kind of see which configuration would allow for the most possible views uh, of the waterfront. So there's, there's, there's another thing that you can kind of focus on and, and that is collisions, right? So how can we improve collisions or possible interactions between people? But in a way, it's a little bit of a trade-off, right? On one end, we want to have interactions between people when we design the network, we design the buildings or individual buildings, which, which often leads to like a large rumble or a large central street where, where everyone is forced to walk like a, like a narrow corridor, right? On the other hand, we want a network that's convenient, meaning you have the fastest route from A to B. Uh, and those things, they can be at odds with another. So how do you optimize uh, for these two conditions? So I've been working on simulations in which you can simulate the pedestrian networks and then calculate you know, uh, the convenience factor of a particular trip and then compare that to the collision network, right? So in this case, uh, this was for a, a tech company uh, based out of Shenzhen. Uh, the question was, how do you optimize the number of collisions, right? How do you, you want to have as many people being able to bump into each other, but still uh, have kind of a convenient network where people are very quickly able to walk from A to B. Uh, and then another thing you can layer in, okay, it's, is, is that, you know, not all collisions are equal. You know, maybe we want to have collisions between people of, of, of different walks of life, right? Uh, so that too, we modeled out. Let's say the, you know, the high executive versus the, the junior intern. You know, how could we design the, uh, the network in such a way that these people would be more able to interact, right? Uh, and then the next question is, once you have designed that network, how do you create more exciting public spaces around those node points, right? One of the problems with the with the corridor at, at MIT is that people cannot really hang out after they connect. You're just kind of stuck in this long place. Uh, so in this case, we, we really uh, optimize for that. Um, and <coughs> we even had kind of a flexible use of, uh, of spaces depending on the time of day. So uh, kind of always to optimize the number of coll collisions and activities uh, throughout the day. Right. So another thing I've been thinking about uh, in terms of you know, high rises is 
you know, what does COVID now mean for the future of buildings? You know, a lot of people wondered, you know, would this be the, the end of cities, right? Would this be the end of, of skyscrapers where people are together in a very small space? And if you look at history, what's, what's fascinating is that, you know, a lot of the great inventions of architecture and urban planning, they've really come out of crisis like this, right? So if you look at the discipline of urban planning uh, and Central Park, for instance, in New York was a result of some of the bad conditions that happened in cities. Okay? People intervened. They decided this is not good. You know, this, we're living in a crisis. We need to do something about it. You know, one thing I've always been uh, worried about in the United States is so much parking everywhere in downtowns, you know, I said really necessary, right? Do we really want to dedicate so much space to parking or storing vehicles in our downtowns? Uh, so only because of COVID, what happened in New York that people started, started to occupy those parking spaces and create these outdoor dining spaces because people were no longer able to dine indoors. So I think COVID too, it, presents us with another opportunity to rethink some of our buildings, right? A lot of our buildings are a little bit like this. You know, think about the shining, this long closed corridor, uh, or, or think about the typical open office plan where people don't have access to windows and you're kind of, you know, super, a super contagious space, right? Where you're just crammed next to another people and there's no cross ventilation or anything. So I was invited for the, uh, at the Venice Biennale this year to contribute a project about this. Um, and for inspiration, we, we, we were looking at uh, termite mounts. So perhaps this is one of the oldest forms of architecture. And again, it's an example of evolution because termites have figured out how to keep uh, temperature uh, in deserts at a constantly, uh, at a constant temperature of about you know, 23 degrees Celsius. It's because they're one, one type of termite, they farm this uh, fungus that only survives at that temperature. So they have all this system of flutes and, and channels that they constantly open and close to, to bring cooler air from the soil and then uh, release some of the hotter uh, air uh, on top. And as a result, they're able to, to do that. Uh, so what if we apply some of these principles to a high rise? So instead of kind of this double loaded corridor, what if we, if we have a large atrium with different types of lungs uh, of buildings. Uh, and what that would mean is that, you know, let's say there's contamin contaminated air, we could flush out uh, some of this contaminated air uh, outside of the building. So, um, so the way we designed this, uh, this project is kind of around this very large central atrium. Then there's all these kind of sky gardens that help pull out the air uh, and lots of green spaces too, uh, because trees also help with uh, purification. So if you're, if, um, oh, and then on top of that, we, we designed these flexible floor partitions of outdoor space so that, you know, depending on the scenario, you could either, you know, work together, um, work by yourself um, and have more kind of flexible apartment uh, in, instead of the, the typical apartment, which is very um, kind of monofunctional, right? There's only one, one use for that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, this is what it would look like. Uh, so lots of kind of porosity. Uh, that was the name of the project, porosity. Uh, but, uh, and then this kind of large central atrium um, in which uh, that would kind of help kind of purify all the, um, all the air. And here's a couple images of it. So again, I think, you know, this is one of those opportunities in which we can rethink our you know, addiction to hermetically sealed buildings and, and air conditioning, right? So air, air conditioning is one of the, the wonders of the world, but at the same time, uh, it has led to some problems as we now realize, uh, especially during COVID. So another example of how kind of a crisis um, can be an impetus for something good is I think uh, when, we're, when we're looking at flooding. Um, so, you know, obviously there's a big problem, not just in, in Europe, uh, but also in, in New York. Um, but the Netherlands has a really interesting history of uh, flood protection and, and, and innovation when it comes to, you know, architecture and urban design and, and, and protecting against flood. And, and partly that's the result because we got ourselves into a big problem. We've been rec reclaiming land for about 700 years. 
And that's why about a fifth of the Netherlands is, is below sea level, right? Uh, and with ocean sea levels rising, that's a big problem. Now, at the same time, as we created these problems, we also created solutions. So uh, what's interesting is that the Netherlands, they levied taxes to build dikes before city taxes were levied. So there were organizations to, to protect against floods before city governments were formed, which is super fascinating, right? And some of those people, they had a lot of uh, leeway. They were almost considered royalty that, that organized. And the windmill is one example of you know, how we created this innovation to, to move water around. So I've been really focused on studying some of those innovations. And one of those is kind of the multifunctional approaches to flood protection. And Rotterdam has a couple of them. This looks like a regular building, uh, or you know, it, it could also be considered a park, but it's not. If you look in, if you look closer, you see that this is a dike. So it's a dike that's integrated with a parking garage, with, with shops and a park. So it's all together in one building. Uh, so, so it's marrying flood protection instead of just having a boring dike that, could, that would separate the city and not offer much. In this case, it's integrated with urban functions. So here's another example of a dune and a parking garage in Katwijk. Again, a multifunctional project um, that kind of marries flood protection and, and parking uh, in this particular project. And there's lots of benefits to that, right? The parking could help subs subsidize some of those uh, flood management infrastructure. The Water Square, another example in Rotterdam, which is a, a plaza that can also double as a, a water reservoir during heavy storms. Um, there's another project called the Museum Park and Parking Garage uh, in Rotterdam that uh, also doubles um, as a uh, water reservoir right, during times of, of heavy storms. So by, by combining these things into kind of the multifunctional project, there's lots of benefits. Uh, so if you're interested, take a look at this uh, book that I published. Now, the, the final question I've been focusing most of my energy today is, you know, what, what do bio-based buildings uh, look like? And why do we address this problem now? It's because, you know, up until recently, we focused most of our attention on, on the building operations of, of buildings, right? How do we make buildings more energy efficient? through you know, uh, having double skin facades, you know, uh, having photovoltaics, you know, energy uh, saving devices, light occupancy sensors. But we haven't really paid much attention until recently on the embodied energy, right? The amount of energy that we put in the construction, the building materials. And this is a substantial piece, right? 11% of global carbon emissions. So concrete, 5%, steel, another 5%. But if we use bio-based material, that will go to, to almost zero, right? Because the beauty about trees and lumber and, and, and bio-based materials is that they help store carbon for us instead of putting it out in the atmosphere. As long as we kind of replant trees and replenish the, 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 uh, the plants, then that's the way to do it. So I've been focusing on applying some of this on taller buildings. Uh, and the big problem is that wood is, is or mass timber um, is strong, but it's not quite as strong as concrete or steel. So that brings us back to all the way at the beginning. We should really kind of think about structures. How do we optimize uh, structures? Uh, so you have to kind of overdimension the structure uh, compared to steel. But at the same time, wood has a type of quality to it that, you know, steel and, and concrete doesn't have, right? It has other biophilic benefits that we now have. Then the other benefit is that it's very light. It's five times lighter than concrete. It's much easier and faster to, to erect on site. Uh, and you can prefab this in a factory, right? So you don't have to build it on site and using machines like CNC millers uh, to cut the wood uh, with robots, right? Instead of you know, using equipment on site. So there are lots of benefits uh, to this. And recently, the International Building Code is now allowing for mass timber buildings uh, up to 18 stories. In other countries, we're already seeing mass timber buildings taller than that. Now, mass timber is, is kind of an easier material to work with because it's standardized. Everything, every, it's like a plate. Every plate is the same. But what about a material like bamboo? Now, that's a, a lot harder to work with. It's, it's more sustainable because it, it grows faster and it's you know, relatively strong. But as you can see here, there's a lot of variation between all the units. 
So I've been working um, at this university to uh, develop a tool to uh, use bamboo in a more systematic way. Uh, and uh, we've been scanning bamboo to figure out, you know, where are uh, kind of the, the strong points. Uh, and on top of that, to create a database of each individual uh, bamboo pole. Uh, and, and then, you know, once we have this database, we can start cutting uh, the, uh, the bamboo uh, with machines to figure out where to put the joints, uh, what is kind of the most optimal configuration of a particular structure. Uh, so we've been building some small prototypes um, and there's, you know, a lot of benefits to it, right? So it gives kind of this charm of a material that's not the same all the time, right? So it does give that variability. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of potential uh, for using this, uh, particularly when it comes to the, these kind of dome structures. We call these reciprocal frame structures because the ends don't meet at each other. You can't really connect a bamboo pole on the end. You have to go a little bit back. Um, uh, so that's why you see these type of frames. Uh, and now we're, we're planning to have kind of these larger, uh, larger structures as we're testing out the smaller ones. So I think very exciting uh, and much better for the planet. And given that we uh, are currently in the urban century, right? Never before have more people lived in, in cities than, than, than in rural areas in history. But at the same time, we are continuing to grow. So the expectation is that, that we're going to add 2.5 billion more people in cities by 2050. Now, to put that into perspective, that's adding one New York City every month for the next 30 years, right? So if we keep doing it the old way, uh, I think we're in deep trouble. So hopefully, uh, all of you who are watching uh, will, will think about how to build more sustainably. And I think cities um, and bio-based materials and more efficient structures are part of that. So thank you. Well, Stefan, uh, thank you very much. It uh, is a very inspiring uh, lecture. Um, and of course, uh, I think that the audience and uh, me as well, I would like to, to question you uh, after uh, uh, the, our next speaker. And our next speaker actually is, um, sorry, is Alexander Salzman. Alexander Salzman, um, yes, here we see Alexander, hello. Um, Alexander Salzman is a, a, at City Makers, a project lead uh, at City Makers. He's also the leader of the Faculty of Interior Design at uh, Shreda Obudjenya. Um, Shreda Obudjenya is an online school with additional professional and higher educational programs, as well as workshops and courses in psychology, design, and interior design. Uh, he works in the film industry, contemporary art, and photography. Um, they have been specialized in distance education uh, already since 2003. And for that one, I was quite curious, 2003. So I would like to hear later about that one more, uh, please, uh, Alexander. Uh, actually, you're also the uh, lead project lead at City Makers. And City Makers is a full cycle company for developing a quality urban environment. They study how people and cities will live in and interact with the city in 10, 20, and 30 years in the future. They strive to create projects that form places with history. Alexander, I would like to give the floor to you. Yeah, Pascal, thank you for this, uh, this introduction. Uh, yeah, um, I will be talking to you uh, uh, from the site of city makers today, and not uh, from the site of education. And um, um, if uh, there is a question on the Russian name, Sreda Abuchenia is it called. <laughs> but uh, today, uh, from the side of city makers, yeah, um, I would say that we are working a lot with uh, uh, two types of uh, clients. Uh, one, one, one is. Uh, local authorities uh, that want to um, do some place making uh, like the Zariadi Park that we had done uh, with uh, De Las Cathedral and Renfro and uh, lots of other projects on urban environments. 
And the, another thing is that we're a lot working a lot with residential developers right now. And uh, uh, we see that uh, in Moscow and in different cities in Russia, uh, high rise is taking uh, the larger and larger parts uh, and the sites are going bigger and the buildings are going, growing higher. So today I would like to tell a little bit uh, on that. So let me share something. Um, yeah. So, yeah, as I said, uh, a very big thing to consider uh, is that uh, there is a large urban growth right now. As uh, uh, it was said today, uh, more than half of the world's population is now living in big cities. And in 2050, it would be around 70% uh, by most conservative estimates. And so uh, how will the cities look like is uh, our major thing to consider as uh, uh, architects and urbanists working on the residential and working on urban environments. And we think that, uh, that in uh, 20 or 30 years, there would be uh, not cities, but huge agglomerations. Uh, there would be around 15 or 20 of them, mega cities, you can call them. And the largest share of them would be in Asia, as you can see in this diagram. And uh, the essential thing uh, within these uh, urban environments would be high density residential areas uh, uh, with uh, skyscrapers. Uh, we can see this in Moscow right now, as uh, there, are, there is not a big number of sites uh, for the developers to build their residential districts. And uh, uh, it is about uh, building uh, in the mid city or at the outskirts, but uh, there is no great, there are no great uh, height limits there. So, um, we see and we take part uh, in lots of uh, projects with density around 40,000 uh, square meters per hectare or 60,000 square meters or even more. So, and um, uh, an interesting thing in this uh, is that, uh, as uh, Stefan said, uh, this is about a little bit about stacking flats one uh, above another. But uh, there is a, an interesting opportunity for any developer in that uh, because uh, uh, when uh, the, the residential uh, buildings are so dense and so high, um, there is a great opportunity to make the bottom level uh, very vivid and uh, social because lots of people live there and not all of them want to go through the city uh, wasting hours and hours to visit some good places. And we can see that uh, a lot of uh, things, a lot of cultural amenities, a lot of social amenities are now to be built within the new residential areas, not only in the city center. So um, about something about human-centered design, um, uh, we think uh, all uh, developers and planners are have now a tool to harmonize uh, uh, their projects, bringing them to the demands of their clients. And we think that this social and cultural program, uh, like parks, like cultural activities and uh, all day round activities, uh, are the thing uh, that uh, bring make the price of, of the flats uh, really high right now. Uh, and so all of the, developers we work with and we work with around 10 biggest developers in Moscow um, are now thinking about how to make uh, the environments better not only how to make a uh, uh, residential area bigger so social programming cultural programming and uh, uh, all these functions are now on are very much on demand by residential developers um, uh, I would like to show uh, a bit from our practice. Uh, this is uh, one thing that we have done um, for the city authorities. Uh, it is a so-called face of innovation project uh, that we had won 
with a consortium of architects a couple of years ago. And this is a, an instance of how uh, this works, uh, even in heads of our city governments, the mayor and the chief architect of Moscow. Uh, winning projects usually um, are about strengthening the local identity, about uh, taking the historical features from the surroundings and about uh, taking icon, uh, something, some features or architectural features of surrounding iconic buildings inside the projects. And another thing is that uh, every time you make some new residential yard to provide a green and healthy space right now. And um, uh, one more thing to uh, say that uh, uh, some five or 10 years ago, Usually, all the, these new complexes uh, were enclosed, and fenced, and not letting anyone to visit uh, all the, the program that was situated inside these new districts. And right now, it, it, we see a big shift in that uh, because uh, all, all developers like C like the city or the public developers like FIC or any of them, uh, uh, they're thinking of how to take uh, 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 citizens from all the surroundings and from all of the city inside their uh, building complexes because the uh, city is now asking to make 20% of the gross area uh, uh, non-residential. So it is social, cultural uh, and uh, for people. So uh, they, they are uh, giving much effort on providing a good uh, program uh, to make uh, it interesting for everyone. And this is a huge shift right now because five years ago, everything was really enclosed. And another important feature of what's going on is uh, uh, new transportation. And this is, was much affected by COVID uh, and by uh, the technology rise. You can see if you've been into Kazan or to Moscow, or to maybe uh, some places in Merck, like Ohio State University, you could notice those uh, small robots that can bring um, uh, goods uh, directly to the customers, uh, not trying to bring customers uh, to the places where goods are sold. And um, citizens are now right really closer to the services uh, than uh, it was uh, several years ago and this will be uh, growing and growing. And uh, another interesting thing is that um, uh, all of you, I think, uh, do know that there were utopian projects uh, about a century ago of making buildings uh, with communities like uh, Nakonfin and several other projects in Moscow, in Yekaterinburg and in St. Petersburg. These were iconic constructed, constructivist projects that didn't really work because uh, uh, the society didn't use it uh, quite well. These were like uh, buildings and factories, buildings and uh, uh, with lots of things uh, that pro provide services. And so uh, citizens don't need to uh, travel uh, and try to find it elsewhere in the city. And uh, it looks like right now, uh, this is uh, getting back uh, to this uh, one century ago situation. Um, uh, these uh, communal uh, residences are now uh, emerging in these new projects because of the uh, high level of uh, inner services within these developments. Uh, another thing, uh, the thing that we are all to consider is uh, that um, uh, all services that we are to bring in the projects are to be uh, quite multifunctional and uh, uh, quite well elaborated. Uh, uh, and this is not now about uh, putting uh, buildings areas uh, for services and uh, about brokerage. It's about, uh, uh, by, by the side of the developer, it's about um, working uh, in order to bring the best uh, shops, the best restaurants, best medicine, best sport facilities, education and culture at the same time in the, their buildings. Uh, 
the main features now uh, are parks and co-working places. Uh, uh, so there is a central activation of social activation of, of the dwellers. And this is a diagram from MASD competition that we have done. Uh, and uh, there was a winning project with ODA architecture. Uh, you can have a look. Uh, it is quite dense and quite high, but the de this density may provide an opportunity to uh, bring some very interesting cultural program inside. And uh, the higher and the, the more dense uh, development is, the more chances to uh, provide these uh, um, services and uh, this program. Like this, uh, you can see uh, two buildings of the different form. Um, morphology. Uh, this is uh, uh, what ODA proposed about uh, cultural center uh, that is uh, uh, for about one side it helps uh, the developers socialize by another hand it um, makes the project uh, uh, set makes the project sell better and sound better as it is a has a social heart, social heart inside. And uh, yeah, uh, that's the thing. Uh, these are sorts of winning projects with big and uh, very bright social function right now. Another thing uh, uh, very important to consider is that uh, um, there is a sort of a demand on fusion of typologies for public spaces right now. It is the same uh, for residential and for office complexes. This is a picture uh, done by PLP Architecture for the Yandex headquarters, uh, city makers for competition organizers and social programmers for that too. Uh, uh, two things to tell. One is uh, about blurring the typologies. You don't have now uh, a sort of a part with the only education, another part in closed one with only commercial facilities, another part with sports. Yes, this is all right now mixed and uh, uh, it is all open for public uh, as this, these two or levels of uh, Yandex campus uh, is now, it would be open to all the surroundings. Yeah, like a very big lot of functions uh, starting from uh, uh, food market uh, and uh, music hall, so uh, uh, a nice ring and uh, uh, spaces for art exhibitions. Uh, another thing uh, I wanted to show you is a um, brand new project, uh, uh, winning project uh, from your studio for um, a small territory in Chiramushke. And it's around a week ago, uh, the winners were announced. And uh, look at this uh, new project, please. Uh, you can see that uh, it is uh, very much connected uh, and very much social. And this is the main feature of the project, not architecture, not those modernist thing like let's do uh, brilliant form. Uh, uh, I would tell that uh, no, no presentation now starts from uh, the sort of how architecture looks like. Uh, uh, it starts and finishes uh, with uh, how social, how um, well-being, how healthy the environment is. So, um, um, first floors are uh, usually included in city life, and in this project, this is the same. Uh, and uh, the area uh, is uh, subdivided in pieces uh, for everyone and uh, parts for. Uh, the dwellers, uh, usually there are all two typologies and uh, they are all the main thing. The main thing is to provide some places uh, for the dwellers to feel calm and healthy. And uh, the main at the same time is to provide a good social hub for all the surrounding areas. If a developer does this, uh, uh, lots of people will get in their complexes and, and uh, they, they can manage to bring in the best uh, facilities, the best brands of cafes, the best brands of uh, shops, and so on. So even more to say, um, public spacers uh, are now the 
major competitive fields for all developers and a great opportunity uh, for uh, dance and high-rise districts to um, be the, pl the best places in the city. As uh, several years ago, uh, new complexes were sort of a, a outskirts if even if uh, they were situated uh, in the city center because of being closed and uh, different uh, uh, all surroundings. And right now, uh, these new developments are sort of a part of the same uh, urban fabric and they're trying to fix it. Yeah, um, uh, in our work uh, in city makers, we're usually doing a lot of research to make this happen. Um, we usually analyzing contemporary large scale parks and our urban spaces all over the world and trying to highlight some functional programs and uh, key components of that. Um, uh, so uh, what we are doing, uh, we are doing some series of spaces and uh, some uh, series of experiences uh, uh, for any uh, small or large residential development in order to make it uh, um, com competitive with uh, all the surrounding city. Uh, this happened uh, to our project Marinska. Uh, it is uh, situated uh, in the bigger Moscow, uh, southern uh, part of it. Uh, what we've done, uh, it, uh, we've proposed a number of different uh, boulevards and a number of different public spaces. Uh, so uh, this new big development would be not uh, like a spalny rayon, uh, like an enclosed uh, place uh, just to sleep, but uh, some sort of a new city. Uh, great to walk, to walk in and through, great to spend a time, great to uh, take uh, new experiences, uh, great uh, for uh, providing the best services uh, you can have in the city. Uh, so uh, I would say that um, uh, the landscape public space is a driver of neighborhood developments right now. Uh, and um, uh, it is the best when you make it different, uh, uh, thinking about access modes, uh, um, providing places, uh, city spaces, providing courtyard spaces and providing uh, family spaces uh, to make uh, to provide safety and privacy, and uh, at the same time to provide places to socialize. Uh, so uh, it is possible really now to locate semi-public and semi-private areas near public spaces and to create additional benefits for the residents. And another thing is uh, I wanted to show is a balanced project um, uh, uh, centered around the uh, big private garden now for residents uh, next door to the city park. Um, and this is a, a, a sort of a typical new residential concept right now, uh, as uh, uh, the greenery, the outdoor areas are now one of the major features uh, uh, for developers uh, to talk around about their new projects. Uh, they're not trying to tell now that this is a new sort of a modern architecture. Uh, they're talking about this is a new sort of an environment. And this is the thing we have to consider. And uh, at last, um, I would say that uh, a little thing about the high-rise districts, uh, things to I think, consider about them. Uh, skyscraper districts are a serious challenge, really. Uh, for the urban developments, uh, like uh, it is in city, in Moscow city, and in the bigger city projects that is now going on. Um, there, these, these are the main projects that were, uh, that, that we found out uh, in, in such places. Um, there is a, a very much demand on comfortable walking infrastructure. Uh, the main thing is uh, landscaping. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the biggest thing is also about uh, weather control. Um, uh, 
uh, because uh, uh, all the skyscraper districts are exposed to strong winds. And uh, uh, after that, uh, projects that we are taking part in um, are now uh, incorporating things like um, providing uh, walks, uh, passages, um, dry passages, they're called here. And um, also, also uh, what problems we struggle is uh, like lack of comfortable pedestrian infrastructure to work with, uh, lack of uh, recreational areas, lack of uh, connectivity with the surroundings. And uh, the solutions uh, in view of this project is uh, developing a great pedestrian infrastructure by reducing roadways and parkings, uh, parking spaces, uh, the traffic calming, uh, creation of new public spaces uh, uh, by planting greenery and integrating pr protective structures like uh, shelters. And at the same time, uh, uh, the recreation uh, connection to all the greenery, waterfronts and uh, major attractors in the surroundings and uh, creating routes uh, to adjacent areas from these areas. This is the thing we are uh, considering with the local governments right now, and this is brilliant that uh, they are talking uh, the same language uh, with the uh, urbanists right now. So uh, uh, making a conclusion, I think that um, we are now uh, in a sort of a new uh, new sort of uh, city. Uh, you, you will you can see all these new projects that are uh, uh, being built in Moscow right now, and you will see lots of them in the uh, uh, next years. Uh, and it looks like uh, these new high-rise uh, buildings are trying to compete with the historical center of the city. Um, because uh, the customers uh, usually uh, several years ago, as I, as I have already said, that they thought that they can choose from the historical venues and with uh, good services, with uh, a small, uh, small uh, studios and uh, uh, interesting places uh, to go, and uh, from uh, fenced uh, new uh, uh, high rise environments. And now these new high rise environments are not fenced and they're competing with the historical center by means of the density of cultural program. And this is the new thing. Uh, welcome to the new world. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. Yes. Well, Alexander, thank you very much uh, for your great uh, story. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed, thank you. Um, what I found uh, really interesting, um, me, myself, I uh, come in Moscow already since 2014. And what I experienced that, uh, yes, uh, Moscow is developing uh, rather quickly. Uh, of course, uh, there are all kind of new neighborhoods. Um, but what I find also very interesting is uh, what you see in the streets in downtown Moscow. What I mean, you see bikes, you see bike lanes uh, nowadays. I didn't hear that aspect in your story. The, the bike, huh? the Dutch phenomena. Is there a place uh, for it in your, in, in your new high-rise uh, suburbias? Or... Uh, I would not tell that these are suburbia right no, now. No, sorry, the, the, the <laughs> new neighborhoods. Yeah, I think, yeah, this, uh, uh, it looks like uh, the, the best th thing uh, on mobility right now is uh, scooters, uh, not bikes. Uh, and Moscow is the city that uh, uh, doesn't try to, um, to put them out and they're hugely popular right now mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they can use any infrastructure that don't, don't need uh, uh, their pathways mm -hmm. and uh, the bike thing is not uh, is like we think it is not so popular uh, as yeah. it is in but, the but you Europe. see it already in the streets uh, sorry it, it was only you know holland the bikes and i, I think uh, uh, the, to me i would 
I'm a, a fan, an ambassador of the bike. That's why. And actually in Paris, um, bikes are taking over. Um, Stefan, may I ask you to join? Yes. The discussion, because we got, all, of course, uh, quite some uh, questions uh, from the audience. Um, is there maybe a question you have uh, for uh, um, Alexander, Stefan? Well, first of all, I, I have to say, I'm also, I consider myself also an ambassador of the bike, of the bike here, <laughs> <laughs> because when I moved to New York, they didn't have any bike lanes. And people were saying, you know, this is not a culture for bikes. You know, people like the car or the subway or the taxi, the yellow cab, right? And what happened when they, during the Bloomberg uh, administration, they started building bike lanes and um, people started riding bikes, you know, and particularly during COVID, it became even more popular. And now you see bikes everywhere. So I think <laughs> <laughs> Moscow may also have a, a yeah, bike yeah. feature, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um... Maybe, uh, oh, sorry, um, Stefan, I have a question for you. You had this, you had quite some diagrams. One of them was about the, um, let me check, uh, about cities on the uh, horizontal line and uh, the um, transported uh, related energy. Yeah. And you had Houston, I think, uh, quite to the vertical, mm -hmm. uh, or high. Yeah. And Moscow was somewhere quite positive I, regarding yeah. the energy uh, used. Maybe you can tell yeah. a little about that one. That's a good one. I, you know, I, I actually didn't share it in this presentation because I was trying to keep to 30 minutes. But, but oh, can everyone, it, can everyone I see it right it. now? <laughs> Preparing. And I thought, yeah. ooh, yeah. <laughs> I, remo I removed it. But can everyone see it? Yeah. Can you see it right now? Or Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is a fascinating chart. Um, so it, it shows how denser cities like Hong Kong, um, but you know also also Moscow, uh, I would say relatively dense, right, uh, have a much lower per capita transport energy consumption. Uh, so contrast Hong Kong, for instance, with Houston, right? If you look at the energy per capita, it's much higher in Houston. And why is that the case? Because when you have such a low density, sprawling city like Houston. First of all, it's not economical to start putting in subway lines because there's not enough ridership. Uh, but 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 secondly, is that you know uh, you know it's just it's just impractical to to commute right with subways. You just because the the last mile, you know, how do you deal with that? So so then the car is the only option. So obviously, the energy per per passenger in in the car is about five times more than per subway. Um, and on top of that, you know, when you are in close, in a, in a more dense conditions, you can walk or you can bike or so. So, yeah, uh, I, I really believe in density. Uh, density also has problems, obviously. Right. Uh, thinking about pollution, crime and other things, uh, congestion. But I think a lot of those things could be remediated. So I, I fundamentally believe in scale. I think cities are. I mean, if you look at the word city, it, it comes from Latin. It's the same word uh, like civic as, as citizen and civilization. So cities and civilization have the same root. And if, if you look at, you know, the history of humanity, when did humanity really took off in terms of uh, innovation? Well, you know, it's first when we started to settle, right, in, in permanent settlements, but then secondly, uh, if you look at, you know, maybe the the Renaissance is when we had optimized uh, farming techniques so that more people could live uh, in cities and cities could grow. So I, I find cities uh, fascinating. I don't think COVID means the end of cities. Uh, I think, you know, cities have weathered so many crises and, and there's a lot of our civilization that we can uh, attribute to the success of cities. Okay, thank you. Um, questions from uh, the audience. Um, one I would like to address um, from Daria. Uh, what do you think prevents us from building more of these projects now? Um, and I, th I think she um, reflects on both yours, uh, both uh, projects. Um, and she suggested, might it be a cost of implementation, cost of maintenance, uh, legislative obstacles? Um, 
maybe Alexander, what I found quite interesting, uh, what you were mentioning, that you are working with developers. So they are the ones who now see um, business also in adding social and cultural uh, functions in residential buildings. And to me, what I also noticed in Moscow, uh, uh, there used to be only residential um, neighborhoods, but now these functional and uh, cultural functions being added. So there must be a business case uh, also for developers in it. Yeah, uh, if I, uh, I'm getting you right. So um, yeah, the, uh, there is a very big thing uh, the maintenance of these social and cultural th uh, things, yes, and uh, uh, the bigger developers are now uh, thinking about how to change their business models. Uh, the previous one was uh, to build then to sell. Now it is uh, to, uh, to build and then to operate and to provide this uh, social and cultural program through uh, or the, or the life cycle of the development. Uh, not, not for two or three years uh, when they're selling, but for 10 or 20 years or 30 years on, or a century. Uh, this is something new to our economy. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it is starting to happen and we are those people talking to them about uh, how to do this new business on that. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I think it's great for the social impact of, of living in a city. Actually, um, you were also talking about um, the history. Uh, you talked about Nakomfing, having a uh, Nakomfing uh, flat apartment, um, having all kinds of common spaces. There was also one other aspect, um, and I'm now promoting lecture of uh, coming Thursday, the cultural palaces in uh, Soviet times. Can there be, you think, uh, um, a place for them again? Or maybe the social cultural functions you mentioning are more or less uh, like these cultural palaces from Soviet times, only residential uh, added. Is there a... I can, I, I can try to answer it uh, from two sides. One, one side is that, uh, as I told, there are there is not a big number of future sites to, to build in Moscow and in, in any big, big cities, except the outskirts. And this urban sprawl is not the best thing to do um, by different means. And uh, uh, so uh, the sites that can be built right now in, in the city are uh, there are lots of instances of uh, sites with older buildings uh, not to be demolished in that. And um, after that, um, when, you, when developer has this sort of site with uh, several older buildings, uh, heritage ones, uh, after they sum their areas with the areas of first floors and maybe with the areas of roofings, it looks like they're uh, 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 there is a very big uh, amount of uh, a area to put in something inside, not only to make uh, uh, something like a drugstore or a store, uh, but uh, they have to do, to do something with a new number of uh, thousands and thousands of square meters. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, they've got a big demand on a good community, on, on a good uh, um, De development really that can um, uh, introduce uh, customers. Okay. <laughs> and at the same time, and at the same time, another thing is, um, uh, let me tell you uh, that. Um, okay, uh, let's start with that. Yeah. Uh, I have wood. I have both for you a question about wood. Um, Stefan, um, I would like you to ask, uh, sorry, there was a question from Daria, uh, what could replace wood? And I think you already uh, were talking about bamboo mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you are doing great experiments uh, mm -hmm. with it. I hope that indeed uh, bamboo, uh, that we will see uh, mm -hmm. uh, the bamboo structures uh, quite soon. I think mm -hmm. actually that uh, Shiguru Ban already mm. did quite some mm. uh, 
uh, not even experimenting, but building in, um, mm -hmm. on uh, bamboo. Um, there we have questions from uh, May uh, Hemp um, be uh, the new material. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 that's a good question. Yeah, there is a lot of excitement around hemp, and particularly hempcrete, right? How do you um, add it to the concrete? Because you know, cement is very polluting, um, as well as the aggregate that we add to cement to make concrete. So, so you know, hemp could be a really good future for building materials. Uh, the hard part is that it's a little bit hard to work with, right? And I think companies are looking into it now. So, uh, so yeah, I think, it, you know, there's a real chance. I saw that one of your speakers is Bob Hendricks, right? Who, yeah. who will, uh, in the future, next we'll week, Thursday, next oh. week. So about mycelium. So I think mycelium, which is the roots of mushrooms, yeah. is also pretty amazing. Like you can grow a brick or a structure within yeah. two weeks, right? Yeah. So amazing. So yeah. I think there's lots of promising yeah. materials. Yes, there are hurdles, you know, building codes, uh, stigma associated yeah. with materials, you know, developers that may not want to take the risk. But little mm -hmm. by little, I think uh, we're, we're seeing more yeah. and more interest. I think what's happening in Europe now with the circular economy framework is huge. So, you know, London, Paris implementing life cycle assessments, right? Mandatory yeah. for developers. So, as a developer, also for, so in Amsterdam, I should say. Uh, in tell. Amsterdam too. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, the, how, great the Woods yeah. Conference had been signed uh, two okay. weeks ago. Yeah. Two yeah. weeks ago. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. that's fantastic yeah. news. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, yeah, Amsterdam has a great circular economy framework. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 really uh, I think you know it's changing. It's going mm -hmm. to take time. Yeah. And we need more cities to do it, and, and more developers and, and architects yeah. to do it. But it's a slow revolution. Yes. Um, uh, sorry, Alexander. One question for you about wood. Uh, what about the wood and building in Russia and the legislation? Can you help us? Because uh, last uh, lecture, um, there were lots of questions about wood. And I know as an architect, we also wanted to implement wood uh, in Russia, um, but it was not um, uh, accepted uh, by legislation. Do you yeah. have uh, a sneaky way how to <laughs> uh, build with wood? Yeah, the revolution on wood building is even slower here than in the Europe, in other different European countries and American ones, uh, as it is uh, the maximum uh, level of building is at three levels, three-story buildings, and uh, uh, at the same time, this won't suit social buildings, cultural buildings. Mm -hmm. No, all the buildings that are to a guest. Uh, a lot of people are to be fireproof and the fireproof in Russia means that uh, on the ways uh, people are running uh, uh, when, when the fire is uh, there, there is to be no wooden construction this is our laws right now but I hope uh, that uh, as Russia is one of the biggest producers of uh, construction wood um, and uh, we are on the way to CLT architecture. I think that is going to happen somewhere, so, someone in Russia and uh, um, all, all Russian architects are waiting for that really, mm -hmm. because uh, Russia woods are the biggest woods in the world, yeah. as, you, mm -hmm. as you know. Definitely. So, so I think after this lecture, we we gonna be the ambassadors to have wood also uh, uh, as architectural building material in uh, Russia. Um, next question from Masha uh, for Alexander: Does city makers make uh, such researches for other other cities in Russia, not uh, only Moscow? Is yeah, there any of, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, you, 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 or uh, what? Yeah, sorry, I, uh, <laughs> I know only a few cities, but uh, ooh, let me think of Samara. Do you have something over there? <laughs> I would say that's I don't, where... I don't know. Please tell uh, some places oh, where you are yeah. active. We've got uh, se several cities in the Far East uh, where, where we uh, have done some work and we have some projects in Vladivostok right now, in Yuzhna Sakhalinsk, we've made uh, uh, big uh, projects for big developments. And uh, Vladivostok is a very interesting uh, thing to mention because uh, 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 
they're trying to build uh, a, a neighborhood city to Vladivostok of uh, about the same uh, population in the same area as Vladivostok is right now. So there is a huge project uh, okay. with uh, several biggest developers right now. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, we've got uh, some projects for parks or for developments in different cities, uh, mm -hmm. um, in central Russia, in uh, western and eastern parts, lots of them. I really don't know. Um, I think all of them, because there are lots of them, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're incoming. Yeah. Of course. Okay, great. Great to hear. Uh, Stefan, talking about uh, so yes uh, about big cities. Uh, yesterday, actually, I uh, attended a lecture where Caroline Bos from UN Studio was mm -hmm. also uh, uh, lecturing, and she, to her, there is a, um, a stop to a certain bigness of cities, and actually, she had in mind Beijing. Beijing mm -hmm. uh, is now more or less on its limits. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, if it should grow, then uh, the city should start another city. So not yeah. uh, enlarge, uh, but uh, build another mm -hmm. one. Yeah, yeah, what do yeah. you think? I would like love to hear your... Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm very familiar with that project. So what, what China is doing around Beijing is that they're creating a mega city region. So instead of one singular node, it's more like a network, like a uh, multi-nucleus or a polycentric city. It's called the Jingjingji uh, Mega City Region, and you know the the question is quite interesting, right? So, is there a limit to city size? I think Beijing is is not, I think, a model for other places because there are some flaws to Beijing. Um, so first of all, it's an extremely centralized city, right? So meaning that all the major functions, you know, the hospitals, buildings, etc., are all kind of in the city center. Uh, what does that mean as the city grows, that there's all this kind of traffic going into the city in the morning and then out of the city in the afternoon, right? So you, you go into the subways uh, in the morning, you're like, <laughs> like a sardine in a can, right? And it's, it's ex extremely crowded, but then the other way, it's, it's empty. So it's, it's just not efficient. So, so I agree, Beijing is at a, at a breaking point, right? With all the traffic, the air pollution, and you know, a lot of this is unreported, but if you look at the uh, the number, you know, the probably you know tens and maybe hundreds of thousands of deaths related to air pollution. Uh, it's shocking, right? So car pollution is a major part of that. Now, now does that mean that other cities should follow that example? Uh, now, I think Tokyo is another good example, one of the world's largest cities, but it has a really good uh, kind of transportation system, right? Meaning that you don't need to drive to get everywhere. Uh, and it's it's kind of also a city that doesn't rely on a single node, right? There's, you know, Shibuya, Roppongi Hills, there's all these different multi-nodes and that kind of seems to work itself out quite well. So in a way, Tokyo is like, you know, a multi-nucleus type of uh, city already, right? So what Beijing is doing, um, I think may not be kind of applicable to other places. I think there's diff different models out there. And, and maybe that's for, for every uh, a new commission or new study, uh, look at local, at every typical uh, uh, project mm. or circumstances. Eh? I think that's, yeah. we should never ever uh, forget. Um, yeah. huh? the, um, I have maybe one latest question, let's see from Mark. Uh, talking about the comfort of people living in harsh natural conditions, uh, such as Siberia and Yucatia. Um, what architectural solutions will improve the comfort, uh, according to you, uh, Alexander? Uh, that's a big question, really, um, because of uh, this European style to urbanism is not... Uh, uh, the only thing to consider while, while working in Siberia. Um, the thing to consider is that um, uh, all the cities in uh, far north are not so big uh, and uh, it is a bit hard to make the social life uh, vibrant because uh, um, the technologies are very far away and because uh, uh, education is a bit far away, but it changes with the internet, really. 
but not uh, so it is this transformation is so not so speedy really um yeah but there there are some issues of how to make these environments friendly yeah uh, starting from uh, well-known things like uh, warm bus stops uh, and shelters and sheltered uh, ways to go through buildings uh, it's yeah it, it, there are several projects be, being built right now with uh, these things. Um, and uh, uh, I think the major thing is uh, that we can do is uh, to provide a good community and good environment and for people not to leave it uh, when they uh, uh, take, uh, when, when they start uh, earning some more money than the middle uh, people in that cities, they usually go to Moscow, and the same was in Moscow. When you've got uh, uh, a good job and you've got some money, you travel to London. Uh, this is uh, one of the biggest uh, things uh, for urbanism uh, to uh, let people stay at the place they live because uh, of the comfort of, and because of the uh, job and educational opportunities. I think that. Uh, uh, this is not about landscaping. Uh, this is about uh, social programming, yeah, mm -hmm. and about okay. uh, ma and, and about making strong communities. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, big thing uh, that I was to mention while talking about uh, residential environments, uh, and uh, I, st I had stopped this thing uh, that uh, when new developers are doing new uh, residential areas. Uh, they now uh, can make a new thing for them. They've never tried, but they're starting to. Uh, they can um, invite uh, sort of communities. Not all people, not everybody, starting from uh, um, um, families with smaller children to elder ones. That was uh, like that. So just this is going. This is happening right now. This is the city for everyone. Uh, okay developer but now uh, when they're doing high class uh, business business class they're called here and upper uh, uh, scale complexes they can uh, invite a sort of a more um, um, uh, auditoriums like uh, uh, people who are interested in one things in the same things small smaller groups mm -hmm. and, and this may make this city uh, be different uh, in one part to another. And mm -hmm. uh, we are hoping that th this will work. Okay. Actually, I would like to tell one uh, uh, part about uh, this socializing. And in Holland, there's this huge problem about housing. Uh, people with less uh, income can't no longer uh, uh, buy a house in Amsterdam in, in almost no city. Um, so actually what I think it's quite interesting that uh, um, government uh, forces even people with low, uh, I'm sorry, forces developers um, uh, that they also build for people with less money. That's only now um, uh, the, the, for the tenders for new residential uh, houses. So um, not only the rich people uh, can live in Amsterdam or in The Hague or in Rotterdam, but uh, it should be more uh, varied. So to me, I think that's that's really a good thing because I think the, the, the city should be uh, of everyone and not only uh, for, for a small group. Um, Jerke, will you please come and join and tell mm. what to do? <laughs> yeah, we should ask our, our, our audience uh, if they have another hour uh, to spare and then, then of course ask our speakers. Um, no, I think, I mean, again, it's been a very uh, lively uh, talks and discussions. And I think we're, we're touching upon so many topics in this, uh, in this online course. And I see very interesting um, um, discussions in the chat app uh, uh, continuing uh, also. Um, and I, I want to say to the audience, some, many of the topics that you are questioning about green spaces uh, uh, and, and, and nature-based solutions for cities, that was not the topic of today. But we will reach that in the in, in lecture number five, and I can't and I can't stop thinking with the three lectures we had so far. If we could combine all the knowledge that have been that we have assembled here, I think we can solve already so many challenges uh, that uh, that cities uh, face. Uh, now I want to thank uh, Stefan uh, from New York, to, 
who have joined us today. Uh, Alexander from Moscow. I think it's two great opposites. Moscow and New York. I always have thought mm -hmm. they, 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 they look a little bit uh, 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 alike. And I know that um, uh, I think in Moscow there is some inspiration uh, done up in, in, in from New York high rises. Um, uh, but for your contributions, I think it was very interesting uh, to see, uh, uh, yeah, the new concepts. And I, I'm I'm very curious if we will see any of it in the in the in the future. And some of it have already has been uh, developed. Uh, Pascal, thank you for moderating. And for the audience. I think we are, yeah, we, 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 I, I can say we're going from one interesting lecture to the other. This Thursday, um, we have people who will look, let you look at design completely differently. Um, we speak to a designer who is trying uh, to achieve an endless lifespan, a circular way of using resources. And this is also, of course, a very hot topic in the audience we see sustainability. Um, and this Dutch designer uh, will well, talk about where anything can become something else. It's going to be very intriguing. And we have a Russian counterpart, and Pascal already mentioned a little bit. Uh, they will discuss their project of uh, so-called uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Dom Kulturi, uh, the cultural houses that in almost all Russian cities exist and uh, that lead in a currently very strange existence. Some of them have been rebuilt into supermarkets. Some of them became, I don't know, uh, sports uh, halls. What can be done with these in, in, in the new city environments? And then lecture number five will be about nature-based solutions for cities. So don't worry that we will not touch upon it. And then indeed, Stefan mentioned it, we have Bob Hendricks, uh, uh, a living future, we'll discuss yeah, the future of design and architecture. Uh, actually, a lot of the, the massive online open course is uh, uh, regarding the future. Now, I'm talking way too much, but I see we have an audience that is very uh, onto the topic, and I want to tell them that we are going to cover a lot of the other topics. For now, I want to thank everybody uh, for their input, Stefan, Alexander, Pascal, the audience for listening in for your uh, questions. Uh, continue in the Telegram chat app, I would say. We hope to see you again this Thursday, 7 o'clock, Moscow time. Um, and uh, yeah, Stefan, I hope to see you maybe in Moscow one day. Alexander, the same for you. Um, and uh, we'll have a wonderful uh, day further, an evening further. Um, our audience, see you on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Recording stopped.